Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us as we begin Accessibility's second installment of the eight-part webinar series, including people with disabilities and nonprofits and foundations. I am Anthony Brown, a communications fellow here, and I'm going to kick off today's webinar about the history of disability. Our pair of speakers today is Candace Cable, Accessibility's California Workforce Program Manager, and Donna Melter, CEO of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. Before we begin, Respectability would like to thank all 18 of our equity and access partners. We thank you for your help in pushing our inclusive efforts forward. The disability community belongs in the conversation when it comes to diversity. It is very important that businesses welcome, respect, and include anyone into their workforce. People with disabilities can be extremely successful if given the right supports. Stephen Hawking, Whoopi Goldberg, Richard Branson, Demi Lovato, and Steve Jobs, to name a few, are people with disabilities. There are 61 million people in the U.S. that have a disability. We want to work, succeed, and reach our full potential. Kids and teens with disabilities grow up to be adults with disabilities. One in four adults have a disability. Their supports and services need to grow with them in order for them to live well and thrive. Disabilities are temporary and permanent, visible and invisible, and can be acquired at birth or later in life. Again, I am Anthony Brown. Candace Cable and Donna Meltzer are your speakers, and here's Candace with more. All right, thank you, Anthony. All right, so welcome everybody, and thanks for being with us today. We're gonna bring you a brief history around the idea of disability in the world and what that means. So we're gonna look at the beliefs, the myths, treatment of people with disabilities, <coughs> some of the models, the laws, the anti-discrimination and the discrimination that's happened for people with disabilities, some of the organizations, the people, also the rights that people with disabilities have and some a little bit about universal design, arts, and sports. All of this contributes to the history of disability and how we create equity for everyone as we move forward in this idea of culture change, because it really is about a change in culture as we change attitudes around disability. And we're gonna learn a little bit about the, the history here that will help us show where attitudes were first developed and how we're going to dismantle those attitudes. So one of the things to think about when we look at access for people with disabilities, compliance to the laws doesn't necessarily mean access. If we look at the two pictures that we have on the screen, um, and both are of me, I'm in places where they thought they were being compliant and making access available for someone with a disability. But one of the slides, I'm use, I use a wheelchair for mobility, and there is a concrete ramp that is built into five steps. The ramp is so steep, I wouldn't be able to get up it myself. And I certainly would be very, very scared going down it. So I would need help to be able to do that. And having a ramp there is not just about access, but it's also about in independence. The other piece of attitude change and culture change is about exposure to people with disabilities, seeing people with disabilities. We didn't see people with disabilities in the past because they weren't around in areas where we could see them because they were either put away or in institutions and we're gonna learn a little bit about that. And, we, and this will help us define what our disability lens looks like because when we begin to get educated as we're doing with this webinar series and we experience life with people with disabilities out in the world, we be, begin to look at the world differently and we begin to look at it consciously so that we're looking and saying, you know, would this work for Candace? using her wheelchair or would it not? And that's a part of that culture change, which is so important for us to begin to have happen when we really talk about inclusion and equity for people with disabilities. So let's have a slide change. So let's just get started. There's, a, there's several models that have been in place around the idea of disability throughout the ages. Now, through a, from the beginning of time, we've had an idea that people with disabilities are either cursed or they've sinned and that's why they have a disability. 
And I'll give you an example of that just in real time, my personal life. There's probably not a month that goes by when someone comes up to me and says, you know, can I pray for you? Because you're not, you clearly don't believe strong enough in a higher power, because if you did, you would be healed. That I must have sinned or I'm cursed or I don't believe strong enough that I could be able to walk again, even though uh, I use a wheelchair for mobility and I seem to be moving around perfectly fine doing my thing. People believe that there must be something wrong with me and the reason why I'm in it. And, and disability isn't about a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a life experience that we're all going to have. And so there, there's three models that we're gonna explore. This first one, the moral one, has to do with that we were cursed. And oftentimes, people that were thought to be cursed were put in institutions um, or they were either destroyed. And one of the fathers of eugenics movement, which is to create a perfect gene pool was Plato. And that was the belief again, that people with disabilities were broken or there was something wrong with them. Or as Aristotle thought, we were unworthy of life. That because we did not fit that traditional mold of what a human look like or moved through the world like or acted like we were not worthy of life so not saying that you know that that these these models are um you know that that they were not they were in a, they were appropriate for the time um and inappropriate for the time in the sense that people didn't know what to do with people with disabilities and so they thought there was something that they needed to do was like get rid of them so the next slide the other two models are around the idea of charity, that a person with disability is either a burden and needs to be taken care of, um, or medical, the condition or the illness needs to be cured or fixed. And so around the idea of charity is that people with disabilities can't take care of themselves, they can't work, they don't know how to go to school, they aren't educated, and they need to be taken care of by an outside group or an institution. Um, the other one, medical conditions or illnesses that need to be cured or fixed. Oftentimes people have said to me that, um, wouldn't I, you know, like to be cured <coughs> of my spinal cord injury? And I said, well, actually that's the most incorrect word. It's actually my spinal cord injury would be fixed or healed and not necessarily cured because it isn't a disease, my spinal cord injury. And so within the medical idea, it's that people with disabilities are broken. And disability, the term disability and disabled is now being redefined as not necessarily meaning that there's a deficit or there's something wrong with that person. It's just that that's how they're moving through the world, which is different. And the more that we begin to embrace our differences and begin to change our environment, because this is about an environmental piece that our attitudes from these medical models, the charity model and the moral model, have created an idea that <coughs> disabilities don't deserve to be in the world. We've built a world that doesn't include people with disabilities. And that's what the, our changes in our laws are about. Um, next slide. So to further those ideas about the idea of, of disability and why people with disabilities shouldn't be a part of the world, there were laws that were brought forward called the ugly laws. And these laws were about making sure that a person with a disability wasn't seen because it was considered unpleasant to have them around. So again, people with disabilities were either put away in institutions or they were, they were killed. And I want to tell a little story about my Myself, I was a Paralympic athlete for 27 years, and my first Paralympic opportunity to compete was in 1980. And in 1980, those, that was during a time when the Olympic and the Paralympic Games were starting to be held in the same countries, the same cities, and the same venues. That year, 1980, the Olympic Games were to be held in Moscow. And the Soviets told the people that were uh, bringing the Paralympic Games forward, that they didn't have any disabled <clears throat> people. So they wouldn't hold the Paralympic Games. So this is along the lines that 
people with disabilities in the Soviet Union were put into institutions or they were destroyed. They were out of sight, out of mind. And that was the idea in the United States and in other places that around the ugly laws. Secondly, people with disabilities were considered um, defective. So once they were considered defective, here in the United States and in other countries in the world, there were compulsory sterilizations that were forced along to people. And this, uh, the very first ones in 1909 were in Indiana. And it said that, you know, if you had a disability that they were forcing you to be sterilized because they didn't want you to breed children that might have disabilities. So bring forward what was considered at the time an inferior race. Now there were thousands and thousands of people that were sterilized under this idea. And in 1927, it, the Supreme Court said that it was legal. It was legal to do that. And this continued on until the 1963 in Indiana. So this is one of the reasons why breaking down and dismantling these myths and beliefs around disability are important through education like these webinars, but also by paying attention to what our laws bring forth and how those kind of ideas start to dismantle these fallacies that people believe around someone with a disability. Next slide, please. So this slide is bringing forth our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who at a very young age contracted polio. And he was using long leg braces to be able to stand and walk with crutches as well as a wheelchair for mobility. When he was elected president, they told him that he could not use his wheelchair publicly because it showed a sign of weakness, which again shows the, one of those models, you know, medical needing to be fixed. That is really a fallacy because he was one of our greatest presidents ever and brought forth many new changes in this country that supported the betterment of people and the brought forward in society opportunities for many services to support people who might be in need of services and also help rebuild the country after World War II. So, what does that tell us that someone with a disability is a sign, having a disability is a sign of weakness? Well, that they're not worthy, that they have no value. And those kind of things then diminish the, the opportunities for all of our people because the truth around disability is, is that this is a life experience that each and every one of us will have. It's not an if, it's a when, because if we are, lucky enough to live long enough, we will have age-related disabilities. So that's why education is a critical piece of being able to dismantle these myths and these old beliefs around disability. Um, next slide, please. So now we're starting, what I like to say is we're starting, people with disabilities are starting to come out. They're starting to come out of the institutions. Uh, they're beginning to want lives like everyone else in this country and they're pushing for a movement. The first beginnings of movement, and you're gonna hear more about what brought forward with the movements, the laws that we now have, the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as several others, was the independent living movement, which began in the 1970s, as well as an organization called ADAPT. And ADAPT stands for Americans with Disabilities for Accessible Public Transit. And that was really the first major push was when people were not being put in institutions, but they wanted to live independent lives, they couldn't access anything. They couldn't get to school, they couldn't get to a job because the public transportation wasn't accessible. It wasn't accessible for someone who used a wheelchair. Now it could have been accessible for someone who was blind or who was deaf, but for someone who used a wheelchair, there was no way to get where they needed to go to be able to learn the things in school, to be able to get the occupation and to have a career and to begin to have a family, buy a house, have a life, just like anyone else in, in the United States. So ADAPT started these protests and many of the protests were around putting themselves in front of, this image shows, in front of a Greyhound bus 
and blocking the bus and not leaving until the police pulled them away. And one of the major pieces of change that came forward was through this movement of ADAPT because now people with disabilities were becoming visible and they were active and they were actually pushing for change so that they could be a part of society. Now, there was a lot of rage around that and, and people were really angry because they had spent so much time being ignored or pushed out, pushed out, of, the, um, out of society. So again, the independent living movement begins. Now this was around the idea that people didn't wanna live in institutions. They wanted to live lives, as, as I said before. And that movement started in the Berkeley area. And that also began to bring forward people into society. People started seeing people with disabilities. Oftentimes people would say, well, um, why should I make my business accessible I don't see anyone with a disability and it says, well, no one can get into your business that has a disability, so you wouldn't see them. So it's a, it's a, it's a circle and a catch 22 is, and it really what needs to happen is if you build it, they will come and you will see them because they will be able to get there. So um, next slide, please. So now we have um, forward, we come forward to the Olmstead Act which was a major piece of legislation that really used the Americans with Disabilities Act well. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act had been in place since 1990, and um, this Supreme Court action was in 1999. And what was brought forward was um, Lois, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson had brought, put themselves, um, they had put themselves voluntarily into a psychiatric union. To, for treatment. And after the treatment was over, they wanted to leave, but they were not taken out of the treatment facility. They were not allowed to leave and they were being held against their will. Now, once they were being held like that and they continued to push to get out, they had to take legal action. And that legal action uh, was the fruition of the Olmstead decision which was justifying the rights of people with disabilities to, in, to live independently. But, but it's even beyond independently. It's about self-determination. You know, um, I can live by myself, but if I can't determine what it is that I want to do and someone else is still in charge of me, that really isn't independent living. And it isn't a reflection of how people all over the world with, um, without disabilities are allowed to live their lives. And so this was a, this is a major piece of legislation and we have a link there for you to be able to follow and, and, and look at it and check it out because it's really something to look at because we have a lot of acts that are in place now that are bringing forward more information on how we can have um, people with disabilities being able to make their own decisions. Um, next slide, please. All right, so as you saw before in a previous slide that there are are lots of people who have disabilities that have been very successful. And oftentimes their disabilities are non-visible. Uh, only knowing they have a disability is if they decide to self-disclose. We have leaders who were a part of the movement in the past and also a part of our movement now. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have Judith Human, who really has been a disability rights leader throughout all of the movements that um, that I've talked about, the independent living movement, ADAPT. She was instrumental in getting the Rehabilitation Act 504 signed into regulations by being instrumental with many, many people on a sit-in in San Francisco, which was now the longest, and to this point, the longest takeover of a federal building ever in the United States. There's, a, there's an eight minute piece that I'm super proud about that is on YouTube that you can check it out. And the Comedy Central, um, Comedy Central is, has drunk history, D-R-U-N-K history. And it's an eight minute piece on that sit-in and how 504 was passed and the laws were written. 
Now it's called Drunk History 504. So you got to check it out because it's, it's going to give you a really nice uh, idea of, and a funny idea of what needed to happen was for people to be able to get these laws passed and create that independence. And it wasn't just people with disabilities. It was a whole community. It was people in the religious community. It was people um, from the Black Panthers and the Gray Panthers. It was the machinist unions offering up their trucks with lifts, being able to bring forward those uh, opportunities to be able to get everybody in one place and support them for 28 days. The person next to Judy is Senator Tammy Duckworth, and she's a senator from Illinois. She's a veteran and um, lost both of her legs in the Iraq war. And she is now one of our youthful leaders, really changing the face of the disability movement and being in the Senate is a huge piece of being able to make change. Uh, next to Senator Duckworth is Ed Roberts, who was really the leader and the beginning of the independent living movement. He was born um, and contracted polio at a very young age and lived most of his life in an iron, iron lung. And he wanted to go to school in Berkeley, uh, California at the university and it wasn't accessible really and there wasn't any place for him to live. So he and a group of people with disabilities lived in a hospital and that was their dorm. And they pushed to create independent living movement. The, the next person is um, Marka Bristo, one of our great leaders who recently passed away, who also was a part of this independent living movement. And in Chicago created Access Living, which was one of the most comprehensive um, one-stop shop for people to be able to go to in a building and get all of the resources and services that they needed to be able to live lives independently. She was a major player in the Americas with Disabilities Act. Um, next down below to the far left was um, Tony Coelho, who at the time of his work within the disability movement and getting the Americans with Disabilities Act passed, he was in the House of Representatives for the state of California. And he was really instrumental working with Senator Dole, Senator Harkin, um, all of these, ad, some of these advocates that I've talked about, Marco Bristo, Judy Heumann, um, Ed Roberts, in getting the Americans with Disabilities Act written and then passed. And Tony has epilepsy, so he has a non-visible disability. He also, once he retired from the House, started the Quail Center for Disability Law, Policy and Innovation uh, that Catherine Perez is directing now here in California, which is also innovating and changing. Next to Tony is Haben Gurma, and she is the first deaf blind woman to graduate from Harvard. She's an activist now, and she's a disability rights lawyer. She has a book um, that is named after her last name, Haben, and she is now one of our youthful leaders coming forward and creating that next level of Americans with Disabilities Act changes that we need because all laws continue to evolve. Next to Haben is Victor Pineda. And Victor is a young man who was born with spinal muscular atrophy. And he really is instrumental in the movement of inclusive cities and inclusive societies. He helped draft the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities, which is um, a human rights document that the United Nations created in 2008, that the rest of the countries in the world are signing on and ratifying uh, to be able to be guided on how to integrate people with disabilities in all aspects of the environment. He also has an organization called World Enabled that is working to create inclusive accessible cities. And finally, we have Justin Dart, who Marco Bristow called the spiritual leader of the disability rights movement. He also has uh, since passed away as uh, Ed Roberts has. And, you know, one of the things about Justin was that he contracted polio at his young age, but he was a white man from a very wealthy family and he didn't experience any kind of discrimination. But once he was exposed 
to the idea that people with disabilities were discriminated against. He worked very hard to teach people with disabilities all across this country. He went to every single state three and four times teaching about how Washington works, how laws are made and changed. And he really helped build that knowledge base in the disability movement to bring to fruition the Amer uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, you'll see a photo later in this slide slideshow that um, shows Justin there when, uh, Senator, uh, when uh, President Bush is, is signing the, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so um, next slide. And we're passing it off to Donna. Welcome again, Donna. Great, thank you so much, Anthony, and thank you, Candace, for a great presentation and a, a fantastic review of so much of our history and how we've seen disability over the centuries. I love how you started with the Middle Ages and came right up until our, our current century. Um, and, and that's really where I'm gonna pick up now and talk a little bit about um, some of the legislative history, much of which has really only been in the last 50 years. So very recent history. I know if you are younger than 50, you might be thinking it sounds like ancient history, but when you look at how old our country is and how old our world is, because Candace was really looking at this from the, the viewpoint of the whole world, um, to look at how far we have come in terms of that cultural change it's been in a relatively short time. So we have further to go, but we've made a lot of progress. So what you see in front of you is a slide that shows the three branches of government. I share this slide with you because this is really important to know. Stuff that you probably learned in school at some point in your life. We have three functioning branches of government. The executive branch, which is the president of the United States and the administration. So that would include like the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education, the Department of uh, Labor, which is our, our workforce, et cetera. We have the legislative branch, which is Congress, which includes the House of Representatives and the Senate. And then of course we have the judicial branch, which is the courts. And I wanted to share this so that you understand that when we are creating laws, it comes through all three of these branches of government working in unison together. So Candace talked uh, for, for a bit about um, the Olmstead decision, which is through the judicial branch. That was um, a Supreme Court decision that came out of a law case. So that was one way to legislate, if you will, but through use of the courts. When we talk about some other legislative pieces that I'll, I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, but one of them, of course, being familiar to you would be the Americans with Disabilities Act. That would come from the legislative branch. That is, is a piece of legislation that came through Congress. And I mentioned the executive branch um, because that's a very important role that is played as well. When we have legislation that is passed by Congress, once it is passed, that legislation goes over to the federal government, to our administration, where they write regulations on those bills. And then that gets translated out to our states and our localities so that those laws that were passed by Congress can actually be implemented at the very local level. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to talk today about a few major pieces of civil rights laws that are specific to disability. The four laws that I'm gonna talk a little bit about are the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. We call it the DD Act for short. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and specifically Section 504, that's what we refer to it as. And the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. So I'll take them in chronological order. If I could have the next slide, please. So the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, or as I said, the DD Act for short, uh, really came about in the early 1960s. At the time, uh, our, the President of the United States was John F. Kennedy. And many of you may know that the Kennedy family uh, had one member of, of their family, it was the sister of John F. Kennedy. Her name was Rosemary. She had what we would today call an intellectual disability. Back then it was what we 
probably referred to as mental retardation. Um, but because of Rosemary and very deep connections in the family about research and really looking to help all individuals, all Americans uh, live healthier lives, um, the Kennedy family was very much committed to um, solving some of the puzzles around disability. What causes disability? How do we help people with disabilities to lead better lives, to feel fully included in community? And they understood that the first thing that we need to do, needed to do was to do some research and to uh, really gain some understanding before we could move into a little bit of that medical model that came first that Candace referenced, um, which started to come through the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. It had a different name at that time, but that was really how the DD Act started, was by legislation that was uh, signed by President Kennedy that was to really build a system of facilities across the country that would really study uh, disability, particularly intellectual disabilities, and to look to see where there might be ways that we could intervene to prevent it in the first place, some ways that we might have therapies, uh, medications and other things that could mitigate some of the aspects of disability in order to help people live full and meaningful lives. And so the DD Act was really formed and, and started, as I said, first with the university affiliated facilities, which later became known as the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. A short seven years later, a lot was happening in our country at that time between 1963 when the DD Act was first signed into law to 1970 when the law was reauthorized and added into that law became the Developmental Disabilities Councils, DD Councils we call them. The actual formal title is Councils on Developmental Disabilities. The councils play a very extraordinary role in every state and territory of our nation. The councils, it, it's really a body of individuals that are appointed by the governor, and those individuals are there to really work with the state legislatures, to work with the governor, and to be the convener across the state or territory to bring all people together to talk about what is needed in the state or the territory in order to help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live their best life in the community. 60% of the body of the council must be individuals who either have an intellectual or developmental disability or be a very close family member. And typically those family members are there when they are speaking on behalf of a child who is not yet old enough to speak for themselves as a member of the council. I think the councils are extraordinary in their ability to really look across their entire state or territory, <clears throat> talk with individuals about what their needs are, and then develop innovative strategies and solutions that can help make communities much more welcoming for everybody in order to live there and to live their best life. Five years after the addition of the DD councils into the DD Act, the protection and advocacy agencies were added in. Today, they are part of the broad ne network that is known as disability rights. You might be familiar with disability rights in your own state. These are the folks that are typically the lawyers. They are looking to make sure that everybody's civil rights are actually being addressed and that when there are violations, of civil rights. They are there to take care of that, to work with individuals, to work with families, to work with school systems, transportation systems, housing entities, et cetera, to make sure that these rights are addressed and that the laws that we have are actually being adhered to. So collectively, all three of these entities make up the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. So as you heard me say, we were talking about the fact that the law was originally passed in 1963. Um, the DD Councils added in in 1970 and the PNAs in 1975. So again, fairly short history and period of time that we went from kind of beginning with looking at a medical model, but very quickly taking that pivot into looking at, we need real voices of people who are living with intellectual and developmental disabilities, making decisions in their states, advising their state legislatures and their governors and taking congressionally driven money and putting that out in terms of programs um, and innovations in their own states. 
And then of course we added in that function of protecting people's rights. So the DD Act has been in place for well over 50 years at this point and works beautifully. We like to refer to our three programs as sister programs or three legs to a stool. But honestly, when I look back and I think about the people who created this particular piece of legislation, Elizabeth Boggs is one of the, the incredible women of history who really put a lot of personal thought into this. It's actually quite brilliant as it brings together everybody in the states with very unique um, uh, functions that they must do, but they all come together and really wrap around and support individuals and families <laughs> and create change across the systems in the states so that they can all function better. Next slide, please. So another very important law, something that I'm sure many of you know a lot about, is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. This also has a very interesting history that dates back into the 1970s. Um, the precursor to IDEA uh, actually happened in the state of Pennsylvania in 1972 in a case called Park versus Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Park is an acronym that stood for um, <clears throat> Uh, the, uh, the ARC part of it, ARC, was the Association for Retarded Citizens. Now that's the organization simply known as the ARC, but it was Pennsylvania ARC that brought forward a case. Because as you can see by the little uh, clip uh, that's in the middle that, that looks like uh, it was cut out of a newspaper, um, was when folks in Pennsylvania were suddenly realizing that their children were being denied education due to their disability and they had had enough. Um, and so folks came together under the auspices of the ARC and filed suit um, and they won that suit. And that really became the very beginning of understanding and looking at the fact that we need in our country to have a system where um, we have free and appropriate public education for all children. And so the Park case then led to uh, another precursor to what is now known as IDEA, but it was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. And that was brought forward and, and passed into law in 1975. By 1990, we had better terminology. We had uh, numerous reauthorizations and, and did a big reauthorization in 1990 and changed the name of that law to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which we all uh, know and hopefully love today. And again, it is really about ensuring that every child, every student has access to free, appropriate public education. They have uh, appropriate evaluation in the school system. Uh, children can have individualized education plans um, they are expected, the, the school system is expected to educate all children in what is known as the least restrictive environment. So, meaning we want children to be educated in their local public school, in their own communities, with their peers, with their siblings. So that least restrictive environment, the place that is really best suited for them. Um, the, the IDEA really encourages parent participation. Um, and each time that the uh, school evaluates the student's IEP, parents need to be there. They can bring family members with them. They can bring other folks who really know their child with them to really help develop this uh, connection between the school and the family, ultimately for the success of that child. Um, often the child is there at the IEP meeting. And in fact, we always encourage that um, because this is really a plan. It's almost like a contract that the family has with the school to talk about how they are going to provide that amazing education for that child so that he or she can eventually graduate from school and move on to uh, whether it's higher education or uh, perhaps work in the community and certainly a meaningful life in the community. Um, and of course, finally, under IDEA, there are procedural safeguards. And again, that is where the work of the PNA might need to come in if somebody's rights are being violated, if a student is not getting uh, any of their rights attended to. Uh, we have that ability to come and kind of swoop in and work with the family and work with the school system and try to rectify uh, the situation if anybody's rights are being violated and if that student uh, is not having their needs met in their educational system. Next slide, please. 
So another very important piece of legislation also came about in the 1970s. So you can kind of get the sense here, the 1970s was a happening time in disability legislation. Um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, is a very, very important provision or section of the larger Rehabilitation Act um, that states that no qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall be excluded from denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity that either receives federal financial assistance or is conducted by any executive agency or the US Postal Service. So Candace talked a little bit about uh, that a very important um, sit-in or, or takeover of a federal building in Berkeley, California uh, around this time. That is what led to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and it was that way of really fighting for those rights to say, if you are a federal entity, so that could be a federal government office, it could be any federal building, like even a, a museum that is operated by the federal government, it can be the Postal Service, and it can be a school system. All public schools are operated through the federal government system. That means no one can be excluded or denied the benefits of being in that building and partaking of whatever activities are actually happening in that building. Um, some of you might be very familiar with the fact that we um, also often talk about what are known as 504 plans within the context of education. So as I was talking just a moment ago about IDEA, I talked a little bit about an IEP, the Individualized Education Plan. But some students might have something different. They might have what is called a 504 plan. So I know many parents um, get confused, like what's the difference? If you look at this slide and you see those two connected circles that are there, they describe what's the same and, and what's different in terms of these two things. So I like to think of it as the IEP is actually really a, a full-blown education plan that involves the student and the family, and it is revisited on an ongoing basis um, and really maps out the educational plan over the course of the school years for that student. Again, as I said, it was kind of like a, a contract between the family and the school. The 504 plan has some similarities to that, but it's really more about accommodations. So a student who might not need a full, uh, excuse me, a full IEP might benefit from a 504 plan. That 504 plan might say things like, my student needs to sit in the front row because he or she has low vision or my student might need to sit in the front row because he or she has some difficulty with concentration and focus. So sitting in the front row helps that student focus better. Or it might say, um, this student uh, needs to have access to a, a computer or laptop in the classroom to take notes um, and to follow along because um, uh, my student cannot uh, write, uh, she, he, she or he may have a disability that impacts their ability to take handwritten notes. And so capturing it on technology might be the best way to go. So that's kind of some of the, the differences between a 504 plan and an individualized education plan. As you can see by what's written in the middle of those two circles, you can see three points uh, where it comes together, which are important points of how they are the same no cost to parents, no parent should ever have to pay for any of these accommodations or plans. They both require the parents permission for the school to evaluate their child and then determine what services and supports are needed. And thirdly, to serve, serve to accommodate the needs of the child through education. So basically, both of these are ways to ensure that the child um, is receiving the best education plan possible um, and hoping for those best outcomes at the end of uh, their years in the education system. So again, the differences between these two plans are minimal, but they actually do come from two different pieces of legislation. Next slide, please. The last piece of legislation that I want to talk about today is the one that you're probably most familiar with, and that's the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, or the ADA, as we call it. Um, 
it is such an amazing piece of legislation and something that is so unique unto the United States. I'm sure many of you know, uh, other countries are, are uh, trying to adapt it, adopt it, create something that is similar. But the United States was really a world leader in creating the Americans with Disabilities Act. And boy, it was a long time coming. Um, as I said to you just a few moments ago, all of those other pieces of legislation I talked about were developed in the 1970s at that period of time in our American history when we were moving people out of institutionals and congregate settings and recognizing that people with disabilities absolutely must be in community, living at home, participating in community, being educated and being full members um, of our communities. And yet we didn't really have civil rights for people with disabilities. When the Civil Rights Act was passed, also in the 19, uh, excuse me, in the 1960s, that was really the beginning of all of this, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, people with disabilities were left out. There are many other classes of individuals that are covered under uh, the Civil Rights Act, but people with disabilities were not actually, uh, were not able to have their civil rights addressed until 1990 when Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it is a very comprehensive piece of civil rights legislation um, and it really looks at prohibiting discrimination in employment, in public services, in public accommodations, and even in telecommunications. Mm -hmm. um, to be protected by the ADA, one must have a disability, which is defined by the ADA as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. A person who has a history of a record of such an impairment, or even a person who is perceived by others as having such an impairment. So a great example of something like that might be cancer. Maybe you've had cancer, maybe you're in remission or still uh, battling cancer. And while we might not traditionally think of that as a disability, as we might think of somebody who uh, has epilepsy or has paraplegia, um, if you are perceived as not being well and not being fit for a job or to enter a public uh, place that is under the ADA considered um, a disability. Uh, the ADA is very careful not to specifically name all of the impairments that are covered. And that was designed specifically so that we didn't end up with a list uh, that people could come back to and say, well, if you're not on that list, you do not have a disability. Uh, we certainly recognize that uh, couching it under these three big categories was a better way to go. Um, and especially because uh, in our world, disabilities are continuing to be um, encountered, to be um, uh, diagnosed, sometimes for the first time. There, there's always new and different conditions of the body that occur throughout the lifespan. Um, the ADA is built upon four really important pillars, and that's where the work continues to this day around the ADA. So that is full participation, independent living, equality of opportunity, and economic self-sufficiency. And really from those four pillars comes everything else that we really work on in today's world around policy decisions, both at the federal level and across our states and even localities, is making sure that all communities in our country are able are, are there to um, be able to ensure that people can fully participate in their community, enjoy their civic society, um, to have opportunities to vote, to have health care, to have employment, to have education, to live, work, work, learn, and play side by side with people who do not have disabilities, to have access to that community, to be able to have jobs, to be able to earn a living. Um, those are all very, very important pillars and really lead to all of the work that we continue to do today. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a beautiful photograph um, on the day of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the gentleman to the far right wearing the cowboy hat is Justin Dart, uh, who Candace mentioned. Um, he was uh, the, the final individual on the, the slide that had pictures of folks. Um, and he really was uh, an, an incredible leader um, in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He traveled the country uh, going state by state, 
talking with people about the importance of this critical uh, civil rights piece of legislation. And he talked about his own story and what it meant to him. Um, and of course, the person you see sitting at the desk signing the law is President George Bush, who was the president um, in 1990, who signed the ADA into law. Um, and really, um, until the day he died, um, spoke often about the Americans with Disabilities Act and called it the single most important thing that he accomplished during his administration. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just briefly mention something else that uh, is, is quite recent um, in terms of a judicial branch uh, activity that's been going on uh, that impacts uh, access and um, being able to have uh, equality of opportunity in our country. And that is the Domino's Pizza Supreme Court case. I hope some of you are uh, at least a little bit familiar with that. Um, so the Supreme Court, uh, just as recently as this October, actually um, came down with a decision. So the, the case was that uh, a gentleman by the name of Guillermo Robles, um, who is blind, um, was trying to place an order for pizza um, with the online app um, so that he could order pizza. Um, and he was unable to do so. Um, I, there was a, a discrepancy between his screen reading software and the software, I guess, of the, of the app. And he was not able to order his pizza. Um, and so he ended up uh, bringing forward a suit against Domino's, um, and there are many of these kinds of suits, by the way, uh, that have been brought forward over the last couple of years, 2,200 just in the last year alone, um, because he said he was not able to um, access a public entity. Um, and it was a very interesting case because um, Domino's, in, in their defense, basically was saying, well, um, he could have come in to the brick and mortar store to order his pizza, so he still had access. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of sorry that uh, he wasn't able to use the app, but that's not our problem. Um, what's so special about the Supreme Court case is that the Supreme Court came down saying, no, that's not good enough. Although in 1990, when the ADA was written, it could not foresee the future of online apps. Those apps today um, are part of doing business. And this is a public entity that conducts business and needs to be fully accessible for all people. And that includes people with a variety of disabilities. And so uh, the Supreme Court has come down to say that um, uh, Mr. Robles is in the right and Domino's is in the wrong. So I think that this is a very um, interesting case and I think it's uh, kind of a game changer in terms of uh, input from the judicial branch. Um, and that will really, you know, open up many other opportunities for people with uh, disabilities and their ability to access uh, all kinds of institutions online. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So what I want to conclude with is to say, you know, all of these laws um, have some common language. Um, as you can see, they each kind of were built like building blocks, one upon the next upon the next. Um, and that's really important that we had these building blocks um, and that each one of these laws plays a role in our rights and our responsibilities and helps us to know what we can do and what we can achieve. Um, what I want people to understand is, you know, when you look back across that history that Candace laid out for us, and you look at some of those individuals that we saw photographs of, <coughs> excuse me, who have been amazing leaders in the disability movement over the last 50 years, um, they were really giants. And we are standing on the shoulders of those giants. They did a lot of the heavy lift, um, brought forward these laws that we all benefit from today. <coughs> pardon me, um, and you don't need to be a giant, but you do need to know what the history is and you need to know your rights so that you too can join us in advocacy and making our world a better place and ensuring that everybody has equality of opportunity and equal access. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, so much for that because 
you give such a great foundation of, you know, what, what are the laws and what are some of the things that are in place that, you know, we as people with disabilities and people without disabilities need to know about and what is our responsibility and what's the responsibility of our government. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the power in it is, is multifaceted, but to really force people to do things, there has to be litigation. And sometimes that causes um, anger and resentment and, and people get very upset about that. And so there's some things that we can do in the future now to really be able to adjust how we are able to enforce these laws. So people understand that these laws are about everyone. You know, they're not just for people with disabilities, they're for everyone. And, and with that, it supports everything, the laws, our social movements, the education, our communities, all break down the stigma and the stereotypes that are around people with disabilities. So there's a couple more slides left that are talking about, you know, what's happening in a, in a global perspective and, and what are some of the other things that contribute to inclusion and equity and access for everyone? Well, one is the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities or the CRPD. And this was the human rights document that the United Nations created out of the Millennium Development Goals of the year 2000. Those goals were written in 2000 to try to accomplish things for the global community that would create more, more opportunities for everyone. And so that was you know, alleviating poverty and clean water and access to healthcare and those kind of things. And two years into the Millennium Development Goals around the year 2002, the delegation from Mexico said, we didn't include people with disabilities in this at all. There was a reflection that went back all the way to the end of World War II and the first human rights document that was written and looked at all of that. And people with disabilities were completely left out of all the human rights documents. We heard Donna say how people with disabilities were left out of the civil rights documents of the 1960s. Well, the human rights documents also left people with disabilities out. So they realized they needed to build a document that was the most comprehensive document that included everyone. And that's our CRPD that we see here that was um, beginning to be signed and then ratified by countries all over the world in 2008. Now, almost every country in the world has ratified the Convention on Rights for Persons with Disabilities. And our Americans with Disabilities Act was the model for the CRPD. And just as a FYI for everyone, the United States hasn't ratified the CRPD, which means that we are slipping behind little by little in the rights of people with disabilities. In the lower left-hand corner, we have UNICEF's very first study of children with disabilities was in 2012. Now, this is really important because Donna mentioned how young this movement is around disability rights and anti-discrimination for people with disabilities. UNICEF only started looking at children with disabilities in 2012. Really shows you how young this is. This movement is defining itself daily. Uh, next slide, please. In this next slide, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, where the goals that came after the Millennium Development Goals ended in 2015 and the SDGs were written in 2015 to 2030. Now these SDGs now mention people with disabilities 11 times in 17 goals. That means there is nothing in this world without us, nothing, because people with disabilities are a part of everything. And one of our most critical goals that we need to see if we can reach is sustainable cities and communities. Because if we can't get there, if we can't be in a city that's accessible and sustainable, we can't participate in anything at all. So the sustainable development goals are important and I would encourage all of you to do some research on the CRPD and the sustainable development goals. Get to know those because they're going to be able to, um, you know, affect the things that we're doing in this country. Next slide, please. Universal design. This is design that is focused on design that works for everyone. And it comes with seven different principles. 
Is there equitable use? Is it flexible in use? Is it simple to use? Do we understand how it works? Is it perceptible, the information? Like, do I, you know, I understand it, but can I perceive how it works? Um, is there a low physical effort in use? Is the size and space appropriate for the area? Now, all of these principles of universal design help us design future environments that are inclusive of everyone, but also adjust past environments to be inclusive. So right here, we have two slides. This is a set of stairs that's in London, and the building is about 200 years old. <clears throat> now, it was marble stairs, and what they did was they made cuts in those stairs, they put a mechanism in it, and when you push a button on the outside, the stairs retract, and as you can see in the photograph on the right, there is a metal plate that is being exposed, that is a lift that will bring someone who can't climb the stairs up to the very top of the platform. And there's a panel that will come up. And once the person leaves that platform, then this metal plate is lowered and the stairs come back into place. And people walk by this on thousands of people every day and never know that there's a lift there with those stairs. And so we have ancient structures and environments that can be altered in a way to create access, but not eliminate the beauty and the aesthetics of the building. Uh, next slide, please. In this, again, universal design is for everyone. Right now, in several airports in the United States, they're switching all of the stalls in the bathroom to large stalls because it's a curb cut effect. And the curb cut effect is that a curb cut, those little cuts in the corner of the sidewalks where you cross the street, works for everyone. It's not just for people in wheelchairs. Someone who uses a walker or um, a mother or a father with a stroller. These are things that work for everyone. And the large stall in the bathroom works for everyone now because really people are traveling with their suitcases on and off aircraft. So we need space. And usually there's only one accessible large stall in a bathroom. Well, you can guess people are taking that up because they need the space. If we make them all that way, then everyone will have an opportunity. And then the photograph on the right shows handles for doors. A lever works for everyone. A doorknob, one that we grab a hold of with our and try to grip, doesn't work for everyone. Someone with arthritis could have trouble with it. Someone who doesn't have the use of their hands or doesn't have a hand wouldn't be able to operate a doorway. But this, I could do it with my head. I could do it with my shoulder. I could do it with my hands. And that's universal design. And that eliminates environmental privilege. And environmental privilege is a, a term that is used in the idea that non-disabled people are allowed to go wherever they please because the environment is built for them. The environment is not built for people who have physical disabilities, people who have intellectual disabilities, people who have psychosocial disabilities. Lots of environments aren't built for them. And so they don't have that privilege. And we want to eliminate privilege when we eliminate stigma and stereotyping. Um, next slide, please. Sports and art and culture are a huge part of uh, eliminating stigma and stereotyping. We wanted to let you know that there's three different types of games that happen out in the world of sports that are focused specifically for people with disabilities. The Paralympic Games are in place for people who have physical disabilities. Special Olympics are for people who have intellectual disabilities. And the Deaf Olympics are for people who, have, who are deaf. And these games are internationally recognized and they support and change and dissolve and dismantle um, anything that would eliminate people having access to everything because sport has a wonderful universal language that includes everyone. So this is an important piece of this whole movement to create access and inclusion for everyone. Um, next slide. And these are all of our equity and access webinar series that we have had and also that are coming up. 
So please check our website for more information and RSVP for these events because each one of these are being recorded and you can go and refer back to them because honestly the information that Donna brought forth is something that I think every single one of us could be using in our daily lives consistently. And, and all of the information that we're bringing forward in these webinars are things that can help us support access and inclusion for everyone. And I'd just like to say thank you to Donna and Candice for all of the information you provided on disability history. It was very insightful, a lot of information to take in for a lot of the viewers that are gonna be watching this webinar, but I thank you for all of your knowledge.